well tonight in our another series of uh, a food for thought the greek symposium uh, our our fascinating discussions with sir james green among the many things we talked about we thought we would highlight today the transference of geopolitical influence from the west to the east and here we're speaking not only of china but of course uh, any number of countries in the east japan has already been a, a strong power and of course india is coming around and i suppose one of the things that will will define in a crucial way power politics in the world in the future is this competition between india and china and who knows that that will be a more significant battle than the battle between china and the united states who knows uh, sir james what do you think of this what do you think yeah well we would uh, as as oscar said we, we 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 often like to talk about this we often like to uh, fantasize about what could happen in the in the future and um you know the implications that this has for our our west western world and uh one we one thing we were thinking about is you know i'm, I'm a historian and uh oscar we, we both have a great passion for this you know it, it's always very tempting to look for precedents or or other examples of what's happening now I and mean, one thing that just sprung to mind really in the last half hour of our conversation is that um, i mean when i was at university i wrote a, a a dissertation about the collapse of the of the ancient roman republic and it's the last century of its life and it did occur to me in the last few weeks after i i read it again how <laughs> how extraordinarily similar the context is of what happened then to what happened now uh, I mean, on paper, there are too many similarities for it to be ignored. In those days, you had the superpower of the world, Rome. It was a republican system uh, by the last century BC, after four centuries of its existence. Uh, it reached a point where it was generally, gen generally accepted that it was inadequate for its purposes. And it had polarised into two factions, the Optimates and the Populares, which basically meant establishment politicians who believed in the ideals of the republic uh, for, it, for its own sake and you had the populares uh, which is indeed the origin of populists today who believed that the whole system was no longer functional and should no longer be maintained and you know we know what happened next and we tend to be quite cynical about the establishment of the empire and what that meant but an argument which is frequently overlooked is the fact that you know the by the time of, of Julius Caesar, the Republic was simply not worth saving. Um, everybody knew, even ordinary Roman citizens knew, that it was corrupt beyond belief, and it was simply unsustainable as a political idea, which is why they were very happy to accept the idea of the strongman, which ultimately became the Roman Emperor. Now, uh, many of these things, are, these phenomena, are precisely what's happening today, uh, not just in the United States, but in the West more generally. Um, in ancient Rome, during the Republic, what people believed was the alternative was what they were called Eastern despotism, uh, which was traditionally the power structure of the great other rival superpower in the world, which was Persia. So if you replace Rome with, for example, the United States today and Persia with China today, you have a pretty good understanding of, mm. excuse me, of the dynamics at play here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I hadn't heard this, but that's a fa fascinating comparison, isn't it? Persia, China with uh, Persia, the Roman Empire with, uh, mm. with 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 America and China today. Anyways, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, the the ex precise same crisis of legitimacy which struck Rome in the in the last century of its existence as a republican state is exactly what has been afflicting the West, at least publicly, since two thousand and sixteen. Though in practice, we know. Uh, as the Romans of those days did, we know that it has been dysfunctional for quite some time uh, before that. It simply, you know, it was the moment that the dam burst in 2016. Uh, so what we were thinking, what we were talking about is all of, you know, over the past years, you know, there have been many, at times, quite sanctimonious statements about uh, critis critis criticisms, excuse me, of regimes, for example, like China's, for which are usually idealistic in nature, 
along the lines of freedom and democracy, this kind of stuff, which are values which are fundamentally abstract. Whereas, for example, a Chinese person would reply and say, well, you know, look at, you know, for example, the United States today. Is this seriously the system that you would like us to, to imitate? China, which is a country which is growing rapidly economically, which enjoys, we believe, fairly broad support among the citizens, um, compared to most Western countries. And, and therefore, um, legitimacy. We, we spoke mm -hmm. earlier about the fact that uh, there are people who like to equate legitim uh, uh, legitimacy with, with this concept, this vague concept of democracy, but... But there's another way to, 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 to judge legitimacy, and that is support of the people for the system, which China has, and many of the nations of the Western world do not have. This, um, this is something we've talked about at great length, this, this magic word, legitimacy. Um, we, at least publicly, although we know in truth it is different, but at least publicly, the Western world has been drunk on the concept of democratic legitimacy uh, ever since World War II. The idea that the only source of legitimate power is through the, the ballot box, uh, purely through the ballot box. The idea of competence and good governance is a side issue. Voting is what counts. And what countries like China represent is an alternative and therefore a threat. Um, that's not to say China is indeed the only alternative. Um, you could quite easily argue that, for example, prior to the French Revolution, uh, the dominant notion of legitimacy uh, came through um, monarchy as a figure that was empowered to resist the influence of, of oligarchy and to balance the whole system. So there, there, are, there are various ways you can, you can argue this. So... Um, What's happening is that there is a crisis of legitimacy. Um, nations become unstable when they're no longer legitimate. That's what happened in Rome, because people no longer believed that there was a system which could genuinely uh, safeguard their interests. When, when it's reduced purely to ideals, you know, all of the evidence in history shows, regardless of where you are in the world, or the West or not, people, when it comes to it, really don't care whether they have the right to vote or not. What they really care about is whether their government is actually effective or not. Um, and and whether and whether they trust that government, and that that's a, that's a different issue altogether, isn't it? I mean, in many, perhaps most of the Western nations, yeah, there, there's there, there's not much trust of the government to provide general welfare, which again is the opposite in China, where where. Where, como se dice, sondaggi, polls of the people by international organizations show they have, there's an incredibly high degree of trust for their government. The fundamentally flawed assumption that we always make in the West is that we have the idea that if people can't vote or don't, uh, can't vote in the system, they must automatically resent it. Uh, that is the flawed assumption which has resulted in many disastrous decisions in the last 70 years. Um, and so what we are thinking and what we, are, what we were trying through history in, in search of precedence for was, was to, to combat this idea and suggest that hopefully what all these endless slew of disasters in the, the last few years may be leading to is finally a reckoning for that <laughs> frankly outdated mode of thinking. Um, and, you know, Personally, I would argue that, you know, as I said, a study of what happened, precisely what happened to Rome is of utmost uh, relevance for studying what's happening right now. Everything which is happening to us happened to them. Um, and, yeah, the core, core theme which has been running through today's discussion, but also other ones as well, again, is coming back to this concept of legitimacy. You know, what does it really mean? We say that the democracy is a fabulous ideal because it means one man, one vote, and this sort of thing. But we know at the same time that it doesn't work as it says it is on the tip. Yeah. We know and you know what? We were speaking earlier, and we have two examples, two very egregious examples of where this thing they call democracy totally doesn't work. And the two examples are Italy, our beloved Italy, and the other is Argentina totally dysfunctional, and yet there's democracy, plebiscite, uh, but 
but totally dysfunctional in both cases. I, and, and, and very corrupt, I might add. And we love Italy, so we can... Anyways. Well, one thing about that as well, which is worth mentioning, which has particularly become quite prominent since 2016 especially, is, you know, we have the flawed... The, well, we have the assumption that, you know, one man, one vote is the most fair system. But, you know, is it really? Because in practice, you know, human societies naturally form conglomerations or groups. Uh, which are by definition numerically unequal. Now, the, the most obvious way that this manifests is in you have urban and rural communities. If you have one man, one vote, urban interests will always overcome rural interests. Now, uh, following, for example, the, uh, the American election in 2016, we had the situation, for example, where uh, Donald Trump won the presidency, but Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. And people were saying well, that the Electoral College should be abolished. but no, I would argue, I think we reached a kind of agreement that actually that system is actually, despite its many, many flaws, is actually one of the more brilliant aspects of the American Constitution. Because it, re it, it recognises that one man, one vote is an excessive oversimplification of what is an extremely complex dynamic. And unless there is a system to recognise this thing, like, for example, the Electoral College or other kind of systems, there will be permanent instability and rancor. Another interesting point we, we raised tonight was the idea of capital cities. Um, the idea is, is it actually a good idea to have one fixed capital city in a country? Does it by definition um, create quite a subtle or deep um, resentment or possible inferiority complex towards other settlements in the same country? Um, does it also have potentially have the same weakness that you create inherent um, stagnation by having all of the powers in one particular part of the country? Would it be better to have a mobile capital? In a way, that there, there are precedents for this. Uh, in the 18th century, and certainly in the medieval era, for example, uh, royal courts were very rarely fixed in one particular place. They were frequently moved around the country. So. The capital city was wherever the court happened to be, uh, which then changed in, the, in more or less the century or the 50 odd years prior to the French Revolution. Uh, so, you know, there, there are positives and negatives here. It's simply an assumption, you know, we assume that the country has to have a capital city and it's here or there. But uh, another dynamic here is and certainly me as, an, as, a, as a British person, when I first came to Italy, I always thought it was kind of weird. I thought, you know, Italy has. Is capital city Rome, but it's not the economic capital. That's in Milan. You know, to an Englishman, that's that was always kind of strange because in, in in Britain, for example, the economic, the cultural, and the political capital are all the same settlement. London is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and of course, not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this, but uh, it's certainly one of those assumptions that we like to we like to question in our in our little discussion groups. And, uh, we don't always find an answer, but we, all, we, we always have a jolly good ride along the way. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and of course, uh, as we've said tonight, we've had a, a magnificent dinner. Well, mm. it was it was edible, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, I'm always very dis dissatisfied with my cooking. And of course, we, we have not mentioned the wine, uh, Sir James. Mm. The wine we had today, no, well, this we well, this is one of the wines. Well, we, we the other bottle we had was... Uh, this is San Giovese Rubicone. The other one was uh, uh, no. I already put the bottle over there. Uh, so okay. so. Anyways, it yeah. was um, Nero yeah. Diavola. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes, it was a uh, yeah. We wine. So we Sir James <laughs> and I. We we so treasure and 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 and. and and give great importance and love our our sessions of food for thought. Um, that that uh, and life is too short, so we drink only the very very best of the cheap wines. Uh, <laughs> for example, Absolutely. that wine there, I know I bought it. It must have cost uh, I don't know. I think it I think it cost like two euro. I over the thought What about yours? Uh, uh, oh, three, three euro, two euro fifty or something. Yes. Three euro. Yeah. Folks, life is too short, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you only live once, so, yeah. Exactly. Oscar Wright with James Green in Rome. Good night. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>